All right, everybody, welcome to episode three of Growing Your Successful Business. My name is Brian Harding, and I have with me Keith Armstrong from Strong International Law Group. Welcome, Steve. Or Keith, I'm sorry. Hello. I answered a both. That's right. That's right. Uh, So first off, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for all the feedback you've given me. I really appreciate it. And uh, just a reminder for this podcast to work long term, we need to continue to pass along the information to business owners and managers for free. We need to grow the audience. So don't be afraid to tell a friend, and don't be afraid to afraid to tell a coworker, an associate. Uh, I'll update a couple things for you for me. Uh, I have some new contact information. We have growingyoursuccessfulbusiness.com up and running, as well as brianlharding.com up and running. Uh, you can find the links to Facebook, so you can watch the live videos on there. The YouTube links can be found on there as well. And you can email me at brian at brianlharding.com if you have an idea for the show, if you have a question for our guest. Um, I can't respond to those live just yet, but... Um, I'm going to be sending out who we're going to be having in weeks to come. Uh, so if you have questions for those guests, uh, email them to me at brian at brianlharding.com, and I'll, I'll be sure to address those questions. Um, also, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, um, we're looking for successful business people willing to share their stories, uh, folks who come in and, and explain what their successes have been, what some failures have been, so we can all learn from that. Also, I'm looking for some industry experts like HR and employee engagement experts, sales experts, and uh, who knows, all kinds of other things. Anything that has to do with, anything has to do with uh, small and medium-sized business is what we're looking for. And I'm excited to announce we have a couple of sponsors for today's show. So this podcast in particular is being brought to you by Harmony Photography. Angie Whitten, owner of Harmony Pho- Photography, is a graduate of the New York Institute of Photography. Her studio is located in Puyallup, and she serves clients in all of Western Washington. She specializes in weddings, boudoir, newborns, glamour shots, portraits, and I can tell you from personal experience, she does a hell of a job with fleet photos and headshots. You can reach Angie Witten at 253-880-2672 or take a look at her work at myharmonyphotography.com. Again, that's Harmony Photography at 253-880-2672 and myharmonyphotography.com. Also sponsoring is uh, Devoted to Video. Dion Baldwin with Devoted to Video works with uh, business owners and professionals with little or no experience producing professional, impactful videos. These videos will promote your business and allow your potential clients to meet you and learn what you're all about before they ever even speak to you. As Dion would say, her style is not a wham-bam business transaction kind of style. She takes a personal interest in her clients and invests the necessary time to really craft the story her client is wanting to tell in their videos. You can find Dion and Devoted to Video on Facebook. Just search for Devoted Video on Facebook there. Or Gold School and pick up the phone and call her, 253-904-7450. Again, that's Devoted to Video at 253-904-7450 or via Facebook. So thanks a lot to those uh, two uh, groups for taking care of that for us. We really appreciate it. And now let's get to our guest, Keith Armstrong, not Steve. Keith, I'm not sure where that came from. I answer. (laughs) I'll take it. It's a Monday. Perfect, perfect. So I'll tell you what I know about uh, Keith. Besides being a sharp-dressed man, which I swear the ZZ, Talks, ZZ Top song was probably written for you because you're oh, every time I see you, you're always dressed in the nines, man. It's awesome. And you're a smooth-talking son of a gun also. Uh, plus, you're a hell of a nice guy. I've never, ever seen you without a smile on your face, I don't think. And that's pretty oh. remarkable considering your chosen profession, I would say. A well, beautiful wife, you know, yeah. bills paid. Those things help. <laughs> that's right. Plus, you're smart, and you don't take yourself too seriously, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here, because it's hard to relate to folks who take themselves too seriously, especially in a scary profession like law. Oh, yeah. And uh, I get the impression you like to win. Are you a competitive guy? I do like to win, but sometimes my losses are actually better. Really? Depends on if the best interest of the public. Gotcha. Because I've been a lawyer who's been working in government law, where I protect the people. Sure. Sometimes I should have lost. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I should have won. Right. Depends on which side of the law you're on. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we'll get to all that stuff. So uh, uh, um, Strong International Law Group mm-hmm. is an AVO top-rated lawyer for 2018, global leader lawyers, business services firm of the year 2017, entertainment lawyer of the year in the USA 2017. So who's a good client for you? A small business who does not have a lawyer okay. because everybody needs counsel, even me. Every right. now and then, you need counsel of somebody with some expertise, and you really need somebody to bounce some ideas off. And your best buddy may be good, but it may not be legal. Right. So right, right. you need somebody. You need a good accountant. You need a good insurance agent. You need to get a lawyer. Right. Yeah, it's amazing uh, just in conversations, you know, over the years people have with other business associates, and you bring up a problem, and somebody says, oh, you should try this. And you go, well, 
That sounds great, but uh, it's not legal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't do that. Well, well that so and so does it. Well, it's great that they do it, but that doesn't make right. it legal. Right. Um, so before we get all the important legal stuff, recently you taught me a skill that you said would save my life. You remember that? Ah. And it wouldn't be fair for me to keep this life-saving skill to myself and not share it to listeners. So before we get to all the important legal stuff, would you please explain to me the life-saving skill you taught me? I believe was talking about having strong contracts. No, it was how to shake hands, man. Oh, that's so true. (laughs) It would save your life. Yeah, you told me in the right neighborhood it would save my life. So I'm assuming it's because of a short, pudgy white guy that this might be applicable in in different kinds of neighborhoods. Is that right? This is applicable to all white guys and everybody (laughs) non-black. Okay, all right, so... Well, we got a, we got an audience watching, but for those of us who, or for those of them who cannot watch, still they need this life saving skill. So walk right. me through the life saving handshake. Well, one of the things that you know about the black community, we are relationship oriented. Okay. If you are cool, you have to demonstrate that. Gotcha. And here's how you do it: show me your hand. All right. So we're, now, now for those of you listening, we're we're shaking hands, but we're doing it like we're getting ready to arm wrestle. Right. And then you do part two. You slide back and you do the fingertip grasp. That's right. And then you shake it a little bit. If you do anything else, you're a p- perpetrator, you're an <laughs> imposter, you will not be cool. This, and you need to get the hell out of Biloxi right now. I, right? I'm just telling you, this <laughs> shake, if you do this with a normal, everyday thing, you will save your life in a dark alley in Detroit. Gotcha. <laughs> it works in Detroit. It works in It works everywhere. In Compton. It works everywhere. Okay, because they'll know good. you're cool. <laughs> Right. That's all everybody wants. Everybody wants to be so cool. So I, I don't give safe. out the appearance right from the get-go that I'm cool. i got to demonstrate yeah, that. you got to demonstrate All right. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good to know. Save your life. All right. So uh, also, since we're both in industries, we're off in the butt of a joke. At some yes. point before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you for your favorite lawyer joke. But okay. um, we'll get to that later on. So you and I first met in 2012, mm-hmm. and uh, our business was less than a year old. I think I, I think I reached out to you in February 2012, so right. we would have been about 10 months old. And I had a ton of questions. We were completely ill-prepared to even be in business in some ways. We did the uh, legal Zoom startup, which you know yep. we've since, of course, you know, solved all those problems. But um, one of the things you you said to me that has stuck with me for seven years now, and I asked you about it when we first kind of reacquainted several mm-hmm. months ago. You told me something that uh, just really stuck with me, like I said, and it was um, you need to approach every transaction from a position of strength. Yes. What does that mean? Well, you want to have confidence in what you're doing. And when you're prepared to engage in business, it's not just saying, I want to sell you this service for a fee, that I want to give you a fair, I want to give you a service that's going to be fair and you're going to feel good about it. But if you don't have your contracts correct, if you don't have your approach correct, if you don't have your service correct, you may make a severe mistake with that customer. So you need to be prepared to treat the customer to provide the proper service for the proper price and give proper response. Right, right, okay. So how can both parties in a transaction have a position of strength? One, you've got a good product. Crappy products creates violence. Right. <laughs> you do not <laughs> want a crappy product. All right. Those are the persons that come and throw bricks in your window after you provide the service. Sure. You don't want crappy service. You want a good product and good service. It keeps people happy about you and spreading good positive. The negative stuff just creates more havoc in your world. Right, 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 right. That makes sense. Um, my guess is because the law is scary and lawyers are expensive, people are very re- reactionary when it comes to the yes, law and getting attorneys involved and things like that in any given situation. Uh, they're probably more likely to do that than be proactive and think, hey, right. six months from now I'm going to need this or 18 months from now I'm going to need this. Even though those things are fairly predictable, you know you're going to need operating agreements. You know you're going to need contracts. You know you're going to right. need uh, to resolve. Uh, you're going to make mistakes. You know, In our world, in the plumbing world, um, one of the reasons I first met you was we had a, a, a failure in a crawl space and we flooded a guy's crawl space. Mm-hmm. You know, and it cost $1,400 in damage or something like that, I think. Uh, those things are going to happen in life. And right. it seems to me that people just – assume that that's not going to happen to them. They're special somehow, and they're not prepared. And so when they get somebody involved like yourself, it's oftentimes too late. Um, right. So, and they say things like, you know, what's worked for us so far? What we're doing has worked for us so far. Or, you know, this things this always works. Well, things always work in any world until they don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, that's and then right. You're in, then you're in deep water, right? So what are some typical things that people come to see you about where you go, man, I wish you would have saw this coming or uh, addressed this you know, six months ago or been prepared in some way for this? What are some things that you see where people come to you and you're like, you know, I'm here to help you, of course, 
it's, uh-huh. it's not too late in the sense I can't help you, but it would have been much better for everybody involved had you planned better. Right. Uh, one of the things that people come to me where they really miss the ball is they have no insurance, no protection, no liability, no nothing. They just open up shop and just start doing business. Not protected in any way. That's scary. You would not drive your car without insurance. This is legal in this state. Right. But it's just too dangerous. And one of the things that insurance does, as well as attorneys and accountants, is we give you procedures to protect your business from things that go wrong. Because they will go wrong. Murphy's Law is the only law that's constant in Washington. <laughs> right. <laughs> it will happen every time. But if you try to be as proactive as you can, you're not going to remember everything. But that's where their attorneys come in. They're trying to help you fix the issues. Because they're going to be issues. Right. But what I like to do is help people be more proactive. Use your attorney as a sounding board, not as a fixer. Because it costs more when you fix it. Right. It's much less expensive if you prepare for it. Sure. Get you a contract. Right. Don't, instead of getting the insurance to pay for the damage, get right. a contract to stop the damage. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting how reluctant people are to uh, – law is a great example. Insurance is another. Accounting mm-hmm. is certainly one. Uh, banking to some extent, HR, good grief. Mm-hmm. Um, people, I, I, you know, again, I said that, I think this last week I said this, that people open up their shop and, they're, and they know how to make their widgets or sell their widgets or right. whatever their, their, their skill is that they've opened their business to do. They don't know how, they don't know the law, they don't know accounting, they don't know HR, but they, they assume that they are qualified to make decisions that they have no business making. Right. And they're afraid to reach out to somebody because it's going to cost me 300 bucks an hour or $600 an hour, whatever it is for an attorney. And that 15 minute conversation is going to cost me $75. Well, okay, that's true. But not having that conversation and making a poor choice could cost you Mm $75,000. Pretty simple math in my mind, right? Oh, yeah. Well, and they give you an example in HR tax. I used to be a civil rights investigator for the state of Washington. And one of the things you want to do as an employer or a business or as a service provider, treat everybody fair. Right. If you treat everybody fair, even if you treat everybody bad, at least it's fair. <laughs> if you treat everybody good, at least it's right, fair. Right, right. It's that unequal treatment that gets you in trouble. So instead of contacting your attorney to say, hey, how should I do this? You make the mistake. And now it's a $20,000 fix, right. not a $300 fix. Right. So if you treat everybody fair, it's going to be less expensive down the road. Uh, but you don't know how is this. You get a favorite employee, and you give that employee all the benefits, and the rest of them you give nothing. Right. And then somebody files a complaint. Even if it's a false complaint, you still got to pay right. to defend yourself. Because the complaint, the, the cost of, of defending a false complaint Thousands. Going all the way to trial, it could be fifty or hundred thousand dollars. Yes, and the person wants a ten thousand dollar check to go away and be quiet. The yes. math works out. You just write the check. Yes, or it could have been a three hundred dollar consultation with your attorney to stop it from the beginning. Sure, a, a proactive is always less expensive. Right, and people just don't realize it. They think it's so expensive, but fixing problems is way more expensive than trying to get your procedures, your processes, and just treat everybody fair. Sure. Okay, so let's say we've got a business that's just starting out. You know, they open their doors, you know, April 1st Uh this year. And uh, um, what should they absolutely not open the doors without? What kind of legal documents, procedures, uh, plans, whatever you want to call it, should they absolutely have before they even consider saying, I'm officially in business? Oh, it's easy and simple. $200 and a proper registration. Okay. Because you're in business to do business, but your business protects you from bad acts or mistakes you might make. If you don't have your business properly, as for all you sole proprietors out there, please change today, (laughs) by noon, tomorrow. If you don't have your business to protect you, somebody could get mad at you, sue you. They will have your house, your car, and several of your kids will all be up for auction. Because right. you don't have any protection. But what people do is they'll have, I'll go, you know, I'll be a handyman with no business protection. The business protects you from harm. It's the little, and it costs $200 online. Right. Done and in some requirements minutes. to have an annual meeting and things like that yeah. to, to meet the requirements yeah. of an LLC or C Corp or yeah. whatever. So uh, we, I don't really want to get into a whole lot to what's better, LLC or, or uh, incorporating. Um, you know, that's something that's probably more specific to each business that a right. person should talk to their, their specific attorney about. Um, so once you have – so you're saying that to start out, just get your license and – Just and, get it. Okay. 
Um, operating agreement, we don't need day one then. Buy sell agreement, we don't need day one. You don't need to operate a game right away, but to open a bank account, you'll need it. You'll need three things. You need your registration with the state of Washington, mm -hmm. whatever it is. You need your EIN, which is employment identification number from the IRS. Yep. And a membership agreement or organizational articles of corporation. Bank always will allow you to open up an account with those three. If you don't have those three, you can't open that account. Right. You can be in business. Sure. Can't cash checks. Right. Can't get okay. your money. Right. You need those three things to start out. Okay. So then uh, what's some basic things a company should have in a year in and they have a few employees? What, what are some things they need to have then? Uh, some employee rules, some kind of rules. ABMIF is on one page. You're going to need some kind of processes, some kind of procedures, some policies, because you've got employees now. Right. And they're doing different things. How will you treat those employees? You've got labor and industry rules. You've got um, uh, human rights rules. You've got city rules. You've got now minimum wage rules. You have all that. Put down something basic. Right. And I can speak that a little bit. One of the things that we learned pretty early on was um, we just made decisions on things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were probably good decisions. Looking back, they weren't bad decisions necessarily. But when there was a disagreement and uh, um, somebody would say, hey, I don't really like the way this goes, and I, I call the L&I and here's what they say, that you need to defer to your, your uh, employee handbook or your policies and procedures manual. Right. And we went, um, yeah, we don't have one of those. So right. um, it's not necessarily like we're writing this document with, with the hopes of governing with an iron fist with this new tool that we're going to whack people over the head with. Right. It's simply because – you have to have that as a default position to defend yourself when you make decisions that somebody may not like. Is that a good way of explaining that is it? That's exactly right. That's exactly okay. right. It helps you. when you, Even if it's a or tradition or practice that you do, write it down. Right. It's going to be really helpful because what the law does is they're going to say, did they act or reasonably inappropriate? And they're going to look, do you have anything written? If you do, you all of a sudden look reasonably appropriate. It right. could be a bad procedure. Right. But the main thing is you're going to look appropriate if you have it written down. Sure. And that's what they'll base on, say, is it appropriate according to the procedures, and is it appropriate according to the law? You may not be breaking the law, but you may be breaking a bad business practice. Putting it down actually helps you make a better argument. So when you start having employees, you got to think about things like time off, whether it's paid mm -hmm. or not paid, depending on where you live. There's different laws on that. Right. But – Okay, so you're going to say we allow time off for employees, paid or unpaid. Again, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, and most people just assume that person's going to call in sick once in a while. They're going to take a week vacation with six months notice and things like that. They don't take into consideration somebody at some point is going to be gone for seven days unexplained or whatever. Right. And what are you going to do when that happens? And generally when they make it when they make a decision when it's happened, they're either pissed off or hurting. Now the business right. is suffering because the person's gone. They're making emotional decisions, not logical decisions, and they say, hey, well, you should have had a doctor's note, or you should have had this, or, or, hey, you can't just take seven days off without pay, you're fired, or whatever. Right. And they don't have a policy to explain that, and then now they're in trouble, right? That's right. In trouble. And you got to explain to the government, and the government's going to look for your policies and your practices. And if it's not written down, how do we know it was a policy? Right. And how would, we, how would you give the employee notice when you don't have anything to warn them for? Right. Because the law wants you to have notice, and then you can actually punish somebody for something. Sure. You can actually have a reaction if you give them notice. But if it's in your head and not in theirs, right. you've never told them, they've never known, how can you hold it against and, them? In the spirit of fairness, you know, I think, I think employers have an obligation to let employees know what, what – I mean, Should. sure, the law requires it, but just in the spirit of being a good person and a good company to work for, I think it's, uh, it's important to let people know, here's what the expectation is. Yes, you have – right. Paid time off. It's fair. Um, here's how we expect you to use it. And if you deviate from this, we're going we're gonna to have a problem with that. Right. Um, but be full disclosure. And again, when you start having employees especially, but even before you have employees, it's difficult for most people who are focusing on how to make the newest, best widget to think about all the different variables and scenarios that can come up in all kinds of things. Right. This is, again, why it's important to just get a lawyer who can say, hey, here, I'm guessing most attorneys have a template. They're going to say, you know, somebody's going to come to them and say, I don't have a policy and procedures manual. And I don't even know what it should look like. I'm guessing most of you guys could say, here's a good boilerplate one to start with just to get you going. We can find one. Right. Business okay. lawyers do have these. A lot of lawyers have their own specialties that their areas. Business lawyers, they're familiar with all of how it looks. Right. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a, a company a year in and a few employees. Mm -hmm. How about a few years in, let's say three to five years in, and now you've got 10 employees. What are some things you should be looking at getting in or having by then? 
uh, the policies are definitely there uh, doing some things. One of the things you might want to do is having key man insurance. Okay, what's some, that? That's a, you're the plumber, and you got a brother-in-law who's very valuable, and you got some other people who are worker bees. Well, who would actually be, who would affect this business the most if they were off for three months? Right, they got to make the money. Yeah, yeah, the ones, the ones that are very important to it. So if you are the principal of the business, and you are the brains of the business, if you're gone, that business would suffer tremendously. Right. And you can't replace you right away. Right. Can't even find you. Right. Key man insurance is a way to help that business get along while they look for another you if you're not able to come back. Right. So key man insurance, uh, for those of you who don't know, is basically life insurance for um, key employees. Mm -hmm. Key so, employees. So if you have a key employee who's bringing in you know, a million dollars a year in revenue and sales or manufacturing or production or they're a key supervisor or whatever – um, and they get hit by a bolt of lightning, and they and they don't make it. It gives you whatever your policy is. Let's say half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. It gives you money to sign somebody to do that job right now, mm -hmm. or Tied you or over. replace the revenue that is lost because that person's gone. That's right. And so uh, you would have a let's say a half million dollar policy on somebody who who's bringing in you know a million dollars a year or whatever. The the idea is you would take some of that money put it in the bank to recoup the lost revenue mm -hmm. and the other money to go, okay, if I need to give me a $25,000 signing bonus to get them on board today, I got the money to do it. Right. 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 Okay. You need that. And follow along with that is succession planning. Once you start to become successful, you want to keep that success. Man, I'll tell you, it, it's funny. I, I didn't even have that in my notes, but it's funny you mentioned that. Um, succession planning is something that I look at people and ask them about that. Cause I've, I've gone to many business owners and say, to say, we don't have one yet. This is a few years ago. We have right. one now, but uh, we don't have one yet. What's your plan? <laughs> they all just kind of leave me and went, uh, yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> yeah. It's a Murphy's Law. That will happen. I, I do estate planning, and I actually had a client who passed away. Right. They were going to get something done the week before. Yeah. You never know. Right. You need to have succession planning now because you could get hurt in a wreck. You could break your hip. You could be I'm not that old yet. I can't, not I can't break not my you. hip. No, you never know. You. you never know. <laughs> you don't ever know what's going to happen to you, and you need to have a plan in place in case you're not there, or a plan in place in case the key employee is not there, or say they make part of your business illegal. Right. Now, I found a business that made almost a half a billion dollars worth of industry, and Google shifted policies, and that business is no longer viable. Wow. Half a billion. Holy smokes. They didn't plan. For succession. And sure. so half their business is gone. They've got to start something new. Right. So even for those people out there who are invincible and, and can avoid lightning strikes uh, at all times, uh, succession plans are good because at some point you may want to retire. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, again, most folks probably start a business and, and, and just if they can survive the five-year rule. First, it's a two-year rule. 80% of businesses fail in the first two years. And then I remember when we hit two years and, I, you know, hey, we hit two years. And we're like, yeah, well, the real number is five years. Yeah. We hit five years. Yeah. And they raise, yeah, the real number is 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think most folks are just focusing on that first couple of years and they don't think long term. And, but what do you do when you're 70? Are you still going to be making your widgets and selling your widgets? Or do right. you want to retire? Or do you want to transfer ownership to somebody so you can work part time at least and still get medical benefits and a free car or whatever, whatever perks you might get as being a, a, a business owner, but not the majority business owner? And the notion that you're just going to find somebody who's going to walk up and say, hey, I want to buy a widget manufacturer. Here's $7 million, and you know, right. have your, that, that's not likely to happen Doesn't in happen. most cases, right? That happens. You want to have a plan, and you make the succession plan, determine how you're going to exit the business. Right. What if you get a partner who's dishonest, wants to steal half your money? Right. What's your plan? You can't just say, prosecutor, go sue them. You've lost half a million dollars. You've right. got to have a plan too late. to succeed where you are and where they are, because things happen all the time. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we covered uh, kind of the basics of that kind of stuff. Uh, let's talk about partnerships a little bit. So um, you know, whenever I tell people I have uh, multiple partners, in the beginning I had two partners. There was three of us. Now now there's four of us. Um, people always looked at me like I had antennas in my head. Mm -hmm. How could you possibly make that work with three people <laughs> and now four? And uh, I don't know if we're just lucky or if we're all just really good. I don't, I don't know what the deal is. But So what? tell people what makes a good partnership. Obviously you mentioned honesty it's and integrity. And those are a couple of things. But – what 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 do you what, if I'm looking for a succession plan? I'm looking to 
Uh, I'm 40 or 50 years old, uh-huh. and I want to retire when I'm 60 or 70. I got plenty of time to plan, but what am I looking for to craft a succession plan and a partnership? Right. One of the things you want to think about are the different the partners that you have. What do they bring to the table? You may have four aspects of your business, and your partners bring two. You may want to add to that. Right. You want, want, you want to think about how do you want to live your life? Do you want to live your life working all day and all night? Do you want to work part-time? Do you want to do 75% of the time? And once you've got the right partners, you can actually take time off and the business still goes. Or they can take time off and the business still goes. Sure. But if you have a team that works together, even if they have different skills, that's the key to partnerships. It's kind of like being married, but it's different. Because you're, you're a team who are working to put your part of the business so that it goes smoothly and put their part. So everybody's working together to make the thing run smoothly, and that's what you want for a partnership. Because one of the downfalls of partnerships, what happens to me affects all of you. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between partnerships. And a lot of people do not do partnerships because of that. They right. do corporations. Right. <laughs> they do sole proprietorships. They don't want to have my actions affect you. But in a partnership – it affects each other. So you want to have a good synergy with your team because everybody's in it together. It's right. not no Lone Ranger stuff here. You've and got to work as a team. And similar to the, the employee handbook and the policies and procedures manual, an operating agreement is just basically a set of rules for partners to work within. Correct. Again, it's just documentation to fall back on. If something, if something bad happens, somebody does something or whatever, now you have, a, you have your, gui- your set of guidelines. that We, we said this is how we're going to operate. Mm-hmm. Here's how you deviated from it. Now we have something to go off of versus... Right. It was a handshake deal in 1978, and now you right. violated that, and here we are. Right. And you can always change your policies and update them. Right. There's always a way to do Probably it. Probably once a year you want to look at that? Uh, most people use it every couple years. couple years? Okay. Yeah. Depends on how fast you grow. The faster you grow, the more you got to change. Right. So um, looking for um, succession planning, partnerships, all that stuff, is it, is it in your opinion, better to, to bring somebody up internally, or is it better to bring somebody in from outside? Internally is always a good idea because they know what's going on. Right. But sometimes externally is the key to making you go to the next level because they'll have a set of skills that you don't know and don't have, and neither do your, any of your employees, but it's going to help you go to another level. Sometimes right. it's a diversity of thinking. Sure. There are some people who've got some brilliant marketing ideas. They can't do the paperwork, but they're great right. for the marketing. Right, right, right. They come in there, your business just shoots up to the top. You take care of the paperwork, they take care of marketing, now you've gone to another level. And they never knew anything about your business. Sure. Okay. Um, so let's talk about buy-sell agreements for a minute. So buy-sell agreements are just that uh, if somebody wants to buy the business, sell the business, becomes uh-huh. disabled, um, uh, get hits, you know, gets hit by that bolt of lightning, uh, it, you know, it explains what happens to their share of the business. Is the right. family inherited, the family not inherited, all that kind of stuff. Again, the key man insurance you talked about there Very uh, would, cover, would cover those situations where – you want to, if a partner were to pass away, um, you could just cash out their estate and they're out, yeah. they're done. That way, you don't have that person's spouse now as your partner. That is the that, issue. That I can't, I can't imagine that that's very successful in many cases. Um, just you know, bring somebody who has not a lot of knowledge about the business and yeah. and and the timing and and you know that kind of life event happening would certainly not start things off on the right foot. I wouldn't think. Um, Question for you. So if my partner is my spouse, do I still need an operating agreement and a buy-sell agreement? Yes, you do. Why is that? And well, because we're a community property state, half of what you have is your spouse's, whether they know it or understand it. It's theirs. And that means all of your partners, half of their of yours is theirs also. And you want to have this information in your buy and sell agreement and your succession plan because, as you just pointed out, I have a clear example of a small business with three partners and three spouses. One of the spouses is not a very pleasant person. <laughs> this is not our business, by the way. No, nope, right? not yeah, yours. Yeah, okay. It's not a pleasant person. <laughs> and they're worried that if something happened to that person, the spouse would actually come in. Right. Knows nothing about the business, don't even care about the business. Just wants to hammer a paycheck. That's, That's all they want to do. Yeah. And the succession plan says, if this happens to you, this partner, here's how we're going to handle it. You want to have that written down because the spouse is going to get a lawyer. Right. And they're going to come raid the pantry. Right. So one of the things I think that, that happens in these situations and, and just in life in general is these are not pleasant conversations no. to have. So people avoid them. 
and they use the, ex the excuse probably that the lawyer is going to be expensive and we'll get to it next week or mm -hmm. next month or next year. And really, they're just kicking the can down the road to avoid having this unpleasant conversation about, hey, if you if you get hit by a bus, I don't want to deal with your spouse. Sorry. I love you, brother. But right. this isn't something I want to do with the rest of my right. life. Um, that's not going to be a very fun conversation, so let's just avoid it. The thing actually happens. The bolt of lightning actually strikes, and mm -hmm. now you're stuck with this partner you didn't want all because you didn't want to have this uncomfortable conversation. Right. Is that is that kind of the crux of most legal problems? That, that, that's the part. That's just the start of your problems. Right. Okay. <laughs> or say that spouse becomes alcoholic. Right. They're they're one fourth of the one third of the business, and they can't even stay sober. Right. What do you do? What do you do? Uh, well, it's not much you can do, but you didn't write it down. So sure. it's real important to have these contingencies in your operating agreements because these things will happen. Sure. Especially with America, how we're changing. People are move, so mobile. They get married. They're divorced. They get married again. They're divorced. Right. And now the grandson is running the company. Right. You don't want that. Sure. You want to control what you're doing. And so you have to write these things down. And when you have employees, you have an obligation to your employees to make sure that their their livelihoods are protected and things oh, like yeah. that. Yeah. They want stability. Yeah, people want stability. That's it wouldn't be fair to do that. Uh okay, I think we beat that to death. Let's um let's talk about contracts. So one of the things that um well I'll just start off by asking, what what do people generally what do you see that people do well when it comes to contracts? Besides having them. Let me mention this one because this is tax time. This is gonna be real important. The average business has, they do widgets, and they have paperwork. They'll do the widgets really well. They'll be really light on the paperwork. Right. And then somebody has a complaint against the business, and they sue them. You know what the biggest thing that's going to protect the business? Not having the registration. Did you have a meeting? Many small businesses never have a business meeting throughout the year. Right. Nothing written down that they actually conducted business. And therefore, the attorney comes, says, hey, this business has never had a meeting. This is a hobby. They pierced the per corporate shell, yep. and now the house is now all up for on the lawsuit because you didn't have a simple two-minute business meeting. Right, and take minutes. In and minutes. Yeah. The business. I, I always advocate three business meetings. If you start, uh, start a business with me, three meetings right away because if you don't have those business meetings to actually prove you were a business – they could pierce your corporate shell, and you become – everything you have is up. Your house. Everything. Your cars. And, and your future earnings. Your future, are, yeah. All Let's gone see. because of a simple three-paragraph meeting. And again, if I'm, a, if I'm a husband and wife proprietor, still need to do that. Still need to do that. Right. Especially then because it would be more likely a husband and wife are going to have a hobby than a business. That's what they're going to say. Right. Okay. Very important. So um, – Let's talk about uh, uh, transactional contracts. So I always find it interesting when I go by things that um, – and I mean I know a lot of people and I've known them for a long time. Uh, I do a lot of handshake kind of things. But right. I, I always find it odd and scary when people I don't know very well, we, d we just do handshake deals. Now, it's fine with me in most cases. I mean I wouldn't allow that to happen if I wasn't comfortable with it. But I think a lot of folks um, in different industries think they're kind of immune to contracts. Like they don't right. need them. Because, again, it's always worked for us. Things always, things always go well. Right. And it's never been a problem. Well, okay, it's never been a problem until it's a problem. Yep. And you have a $20,000 order that you don't have a contract on, and somebody doesn't keep their end of the bargain, and now now what do you do? So yep. um, talk to us about when is a, con a transactional contract necessary and when is it not? As a lawyer, I would say I have a contract. Every time. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> People lie. What? People lie. Stop it. Sexual harassment. Uh, false refund. Right. Uh, they've got all of these ide identity theft out there. They will actually send send things to you by mail and say you didn't you didn't send my pro. What do you mean? You never made an order. Here's my receipt. Right. Uh, you gotta have something written to show that you've transacted the business because the handshake it, those days are still good, and it's always good until something goes wrong. Right. Something will go wrong. Right. Murphy's law. Sure. Even with your best customer, something's going to go wrong. Right. And, and uh, whenever I've talked to folks about this kind of stuff, I've always said, you know, what's the dollar amount? It, it, if it's a $500 deal and if it goes wrong and, and you know, it's like loaning a family member mon money, right? Right. If you, if you can afford to give it to them and never get it back, then loan the money. If, yes. The same thing with the transaction. If it's a $500 transaction and you don't care if you don't get your money, then don't write the contract. If it's a $25,000 right. transaction, I mean, that would hurt if you didn't get paid. Right. You better write a contract. Right. 
It will. Right. And, and this is good business. Everybody has their same expectation. When you have something written down, you know what to expect. They know what to expect. If something goes wrong, you still know what to expect. Right. That's the problem is when things go wrong, the expectations go out the window. Right. Because I thought you said this, and mm-hmm. you thought I said that, and mm-hmm. it's all it's all it's all nonsense at that point mm-hmm. because there's nothing written down. It's, and you just say it's, been, it's doing business. It's not personal; it's just business. Right. And you know, like in uh, in construction, especially, uh, you know, somebody's getting something repaired, whether it's electrical, plumbing, roofing, you know, whatever, uh, HVAC, and you call the you call the the company to come out and fix things, and they got to put a hole in the wall. Simple things like, well, I thought you were gonna put the, I thought you were gonna fix the drywall. Uh-huh. Well, I'm, a, I'm an electri- I'm electrician. I don't do drywall. I thought you were gonna hire a drywall guy when I was done. Simple things like that can turn, you know, a two hundred dollar fix, you know, yeah. to get the drywall done could turn into a, a relationship ender because you didn't want to take the five minutes to just have them sign a contract right. or delay the project, which may cost more. Right. It right, is right. really helpful to have contracts. I mean, don't have to be that extensive, but it's good to have so that everybody knows on the same page. And that's really what you want in business. You want to be on the same page with your suppliers, your providers, your customers. And it's something that everybody knows what to expect when they come to deal with you. Contracts right. help you. Right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, if I'm running a small business, like we have our sponsors there are photographers mm-hmm. or and videographers, a photographer, should somebody in a photography studio, should they have a contract? Yes, they should. Why? Because you make them look bad. How are you going to, what are you going to say? <laughs> so if the photographer takes a picture the client doesn't like, then basically, basically our contract's going to say, we don't guarantee you're going to like it. Yeah, they need to say that's, that. That's pretty much, okay. Yeah, that <laughs> they makes need sense. to say that because they, people will lie. Right. Before I came to the studio, I just got a fax from a potential client where someone lied on them. Yeah. I'm just straight up lying. They made up something. What even in the state. And now they've got to spend money to go defend because they were supposed to be in a work, working relationship. No contract. Right. So the person said, oh, yeah, I worked for them. The person said, no, you didn't. Where's your contract? Wow. Even volunteers. Volunteer contract. Everybody knows what to expect. Sure. And again, it's, it's, you know, for me, it always goes back to people not wanting to have the uncomfortable conversation up front. Here's all the things you're not going to like when I'm done. <laughs> Who wants to have that conversation, right? We hate that. Uh, but that's the, that's the fact of life. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do X, and you're going to expect Y. And here's the difference. And mm-hmm. here, I'm telling you up front, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I hope you get it done by a great professional. That's not in my wheelhouse. It's not something I can take care of. Right. Um, I think a lot of folks would just rather hope that the person buying assumes correctly that this isn't something they take care of and everybody's going to end up happy. Right. And that probably doesn't happen as often as they would like. It happens a lot in America. That's why we're used to it. We're used to good relations. We're used to people keeping the word. We're used to people being honest. But there's just a few who are not. Right. And those are growing. Right. <laughs> used to be everybody was honest but a few bad apples. Those few bad apples are now 10 or 12. Sure. It's right, just right. getting worse and worse. So give me some examples of just uh, other than contractual stuff and partnerships and stuff. Just give me some examples of things that, that people have come to you and and, and uh, just it's just a mess when you get it. Yeah, And you may or may not have been able to fix it, but you get it and it's like, man, you did this and that was just dumb. <laughs> and then you followed up with this and that was just stupid and you did this and that should have happened six months ago. What are some things that, that – Patterns of things or specific examples of things you see people and you're like, man, what were you thinking? Well, let me go. This taxes time is on my mind right now. I had a client who never had a meeting on his business. Right. Been in business 12 years, <clears throat> never had a meeting. And now his accountant is looking for all of his paperwork so that they can file taxes. Right. He had to actually go and f- the lucky thing for him is that client met with me several times during the year and I documented it. Sure. He actually can validate he had a meeting. But do you know he's got to pay over fifty thousand dollars in taxes because he could prove that he had meetings? Fifty thousand dollars in taxes. So not documenting a meeting was going every cost quarter or whatever cost fifty thousand dollars. Wow. And I saved him because I happened to be the person he was meeting with. Wow. I said, "Did you write these meetings down?" No. I said, "You're in business. You got to have meetings. All businesses have meetings." Yeah, but I'm a sole proprietor. No. You still have meetings, even if it's just you. You meeting with your accountant, meet with your tax attorney. Need, it's all kinds of stuff. Fifty thousand dollars was saved him just by having meetings. Wow! One so paragraph. sole proprietors still need to have document meetings, even if they're talking to themselves or talking yep. to attorneys or what? Okay, right. yeah, can't believe it. That happened last year. 
Wow. $50,000. That's, that's, so that's, just as that simple. That's Here's another one. Self-help legal business. <laughs> I had a client in Pierce County, went to court on his own. He had a business. What he did not know and was surprising to me is if you are a business in the state of Washington, you cannot go to court and defend yourself. Wow. Not allowed in court. So what he did is he grabbed on the Internet somebody's legal brief. He grabbed somebody else's name, put them together, and went to court. <laughs> and they told him, you are not allowed to come. You right. have to hire an attorney. Right. So he hired me. I couldn't fix it. Wow. He, he, he grabbed somebody from Linwood. They wasn't even his attorney. They yeah. had never heard him before. Right. He grabbed somebody's brief that wasn't his. It just sounded good. Yeah. And I was supposed to, I couldn't fix it. Right. I fixed 11 problems that I found in his case. But the one problem I couldn't fix was that one where he went to court and represented himself using and, somebody else's And he was dishonest in the process by oh, stealing somebody else's yes, stuff. Yes, exactly. Some of the attorneys. <laughs> Two attorneys. That's ballsy to steal an attorney's stuff. Well, I was pretty happy that I fixed 11 separate problems. Right. But I lost the whole case because of that one that he screwed up. Yeah. Do not represent yourself in court. Right. First of all, you can't. Yeah. Second, the court will throw you out. Yeah. Third, I hope I can fix it. Yeah. And I what, couldn't fix what's the it. saying? A, uh, a counselor has himself for, an, for a client, has a fool for a yes. client or something like yes. that? Yeah, yeah. Yes. What else you got? What, are, what other blunders have, see, have people made? <sighs> Always have an emergency plan. If you don't have an emergency plan in your place of business, you need something. There's like, always good. like Mount Rainier blows. Kind of Mount emergency? Rainier blows. Oh, okay. Electrical power goes out. Um, how about this one? It's the ransomware right. on your internet. Right. Hospitals are doing this right now. Somebody will come and do ransomware and say all of your patient records. If you don't give us fifty thousand in digital currency, mm -hmm. we won't. They have to do it, right? Because they can't get them back, right? You got to prepare for that. Simple software, less than a hundred dollars, can protect you from ransomware. You got to protect these things before they happen because after they happen, it may take $25,000 just to try to decrypt all of your documents, right. which is privacy information for your clients. Sure. And then you got to tell all of them yeah. that all of your stuff is on the internet right now. And you pay the person $25,000 and you just take their word that they're going to go ahead and give it back to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. D digital is really critical right now. There's a lot of law firms gearing up to protect people, but it's too late. At that point. Right. Because most of the lawyers are not that digitally. I mean, a lot of people know digital. Some people don't. It's when those a sophisticated identity theft companies come. Oh, it's tough. It's tough. Right. So when you say prepare for an emergency like a natural disaster, yes. you know, uh, um, Mount Rainier blows or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever, uh, there's a major earthquake, let's say, um, and people just can't get to work. You know, what, 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 is, what is a good thing for employers or just people, sole proprietors or whoever – what is that plan supposed to look like? Well, when you have it, it can be very simple. It is, if we are not able to open, here's our process. If we're not able to physically open our doors, what do you do? What do they do? How do you the continue employee. business? The employee. Gotcha. And it's something you set up so that everybody has on the same page. Because some things will happen. We have a flood. Think about all the floods that's been happening all throughout America. What happened to those businesses? Some of them, nothing. They actually went under and they're not going to come back mm -hmm. because they didn't prepare for an emergency, which is happening every day now. Right. I mean, well, crazy weather. Here in Western Washington, we just, a few months ago, we just had a um, you know, massive snowstorm, which uh -huh. we're, we're not, we don't get snow that often, so we're not really no. prepared for it. So uh, many businesses were closed down for a couple of days to a couple, you know, I don't know, two weeks, maybe maybe a we week though. Mm -hmm. Um you know, and and they just what you're saying is notify your employees. Here's what's going to happen in the event something like this happens. Here's what we expect from you, the employee, right. as the right. employer. We expect you to you know check in every once in a while or whatever your whatever your expectations are. Right. Um, what about uh, do we need to share that plan with our customers or are we just is this just an internal thing? Internal. Okay. It's internal gotcha. because what you're trying to do is provide services to the outside public. When you are not able to perform, how does that happen? What if you have a a, a shooter on scene? Right. What happens? Is there an emergency button? Is there a safety button? What if you have some crazed person come in and wants to shoot up the place? Right. What do you do? And the reason why I think this is important, I used to be an assistant attorney general for the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. And this was not my job. 
but because I had some customer skills, we actually had some shooter situations, emergency, WSP called, state patrol call. Wow. This guy is going to endanger the governor's, I mean, the attorney general's office. They didn't know who to call, so they called an attorney general. Well, I happened to be the one answering the phone. Right. I had to go talk this guy down from a dangerous situation. And I am thought, what's our process for this? <laughs> that calling an attorney general, a lawyer, is not going to help you when somebody's got a gun. Right, right, right. Well, that five times in 20 years that happened. Wow. It was crazy. Was Four crazy. of the times I was unlucky enough to be at the phone. Yeah. So I actually had to deal with it. One guy had a computer. He was so mad about Best Buy or some some kind of computer store. He was so upset. He went to Attorney General's office and he was actually trying to hit someone with the computer. Gotcha. So they had WSP at gunpoint trying to keep this guy from beating up on state employees, and I had to talk him down. I'm thinking we needed a process for this. Right. So so for for folks who are running small businesses, uh, I'm guessing that if you just met with your attorney once a year and spent two hours with them. Um, just in general conversation, how things going, the attorney's spidey sense is going to go off, you know, 14 times or so in two hours and go, ah, we should probably talk about that. Oh, you're doing that. We should probably talk about that. Mm -hmm. Um, how often should somebody be just meeting with their attorney just to, Hey, here's just a state of the union kind of a thing. Here's mm -hmm. how we're going. You know, attorney Joe brings some questions and, right. and just kind of sort out those things. Nobody is going to think about be prepared for an active shooter coming into place, probably, right. unless you run a Walgreens and corporates told you to. That's right. That's um, right. I imagine that those kind of things aren't things that pop in people's minds, generally speaking. So how often should folks just meet with their attorney just to run through things? I would say periodically, maybe not quarterly, but just periodically, two or three times a year. You need to just touch base with your attorney because things will change. You'll want to expand. You want to do some things. And I would talk with them because there may be a better way to do it than what you're thinking of. Because right. you're thinking about the best widgets. But the attorneys all think about the best widgets in this state law and the regulations. Oh, yeah, how to protect you. Just, yeah. <laughs> they just change that regulations. You probably weren't aware of that. There's a lot of things you might want to do differently if you knew what the legal ramifications are going to be. Sure. And yeah, and that's, so, that's one thing that uh, the government does not do a, a significantly good job at they do notifying not. people of law changes. Uh, law passes in March or April. It may go into effect July 1st. It may go into you know, effect September 1st, January 1st next year. So laws are changing throughout the year. All the time. And we, nobody gets an email notification that says, hey, this law applying to you changed. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. So, yeah, I, I would suggest uh, quarterly. Periodically. Yeah, quarterly, probably. Mm -hmm. Again, depending on how big your business is. Just to touch so, base. So uh, let's, let's wrap up with some home runs. So give me some success stories. What do people come to you with, and you're like, man, this couldn't have went any better. Good job. Oh, well, one is when they've come and they've got something in writing that they did. Right. They said, look, I have employees making a complaint. What'd you do? Here's my process, and I did that. Good. Protect it. Right. Not that you're right. Yeah. But protect it. Yeah. Because so, that's the key. So, so I think that's a key thing for folks to hear is it's, it's not important if your decision was, quote, unquote, right or wrong. Right. It matters if you followed your procedure. That's right. That's right. That is the actual help in court. Gotcha. Because they don't have to be against the law. It could be a bad business practice. That's just bad business. But it's not going to help you if you just made it up and it was in your head. Right. It is something that you wrote down is going to be helpful. Another thing that I like what people do is they'll come in and say, you know what, I treat everybody fairly because I see a lot of unfair things happening. And that's when people come to me, when it's unfair. Right. But when you treat everybody fair, and says, look, you know what, everybody gets this refund. I don't care what the situation is, they get this refund. I treated everybody the same, and this person's saying something different. This is my practice. If you have a practice of doing something, even if it's not written down, but there's a practice that you can show, demonstrate, and get somebody to third party say, yes, this happened, you can be protected. Because sometimes it's not the law, it's not your written policy, but it's been your practice that you've been doing for 20 years. And you can demonstrate that, you can be protected in court on that. Right. Just so, a practice. So just a question just popped into my head. So let's say that you're, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, you're a pretty reasonable person, you're making good decisions, you're treating people fairly, and you come in one day and you're just in a bad mood or you're in an exceptionally good mood and you just say something that you just you just shouldn't have. You say something really stupid to somebody who's a protected class or you right. you make a reference to somebody's age or race mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. and you just completely step in it. 
how do you undo that? What do you do? Here's and I'm not, I'm not asking because I've recently done this. Although right. <laughs> over my career, I've probably done it, but I, I don't think I've done it recently. So, <laughs> Here's what helps you, and this is what I've used to defend somebody. What is your practice? If you've had one bonehead statement, but you had a whole year of perfectly, that is going to be an outlier. The court is not going to look at you as the bonehead person that made that statement. They don't look at you as this is a person who's been all year, 364 days a year, have been nice and cordial and protected, and they made this one bonehead. That is not going to actually be because they're, they're looking for practice of somebody being bad right. or bad behavior, not one time. So your practice is actually your best defense is your practice. Right. How you are every day can protect you even against the law. So how is that going to work? Uh, 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 there would be an investigation, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. if somebody filed a complaint. They'd come in and interview other employees. Mm-hmm. And if, if the employees say, yeah, this you know, Joe Schmo is a great guy, 90% of the time he said something stupid, I wish he wouldn't have said it, but mm-hmm. – I don't know what was it got, got into him that day. That's not how he operates. Is that how they make their decision? That's part of how they make their decision. But it's sometimes that's the most powerful part because they won't have an actual smoking gun. Right. They'll have, there's a complaint. Is this, and what they'll do is they'll do an investigation. To say, is this complaint legitimate? And they'll ask interviews and they'll say, how is this person normally? If they say, well, you know, he makes this kind of stuff all the time. Right. They're going to say, well, this is probably true too. <laughs> Even with no proof. Right. The fact that you've made bonehead statements once a month yeah. And the 13th time, now you made another one. Yeah, yeah. Well, he probably made it, even if you didn't do it. Right. They're going to lean towards you probably have made a bad bonehead because that's how you are. Right. But if you've made no bonehead statements and you made one, the investigator, government or private, is going to not hold that against you because you've got a consistent pattern of doing the opposite. Right. So sometimes just being, being good and nice to everybody right. helps you. Gotcha. Even if you lose your cool, because sometimes hum- you might lose your cool. So the attorney is saying, "Be a good human being." <laughs> Most of <laughs> the time, fantastic. that's, that's going to help you. It's going right. to help you. You got anything else? Anything else you want to wrap up with on a positive note? You got any other success stories there you want to give us? The only thing I want to tell you is that sometimes you lose the battle, but you win the war. What do you mean by that? Uh, I have had several cases where I've won. I've had several cases where I've lost. But the key is, did the objective? actually get achieved the objective is what you want not the wins and the loss right because i can lose a lot of times but i get to get it done or i may win a lot of times but the problem is still there right sometimes winning the war is is the key not or not just the yeah i think i think in general uh again folks who are running and managing small businesses or owning them um you've got a million things on your plate right now yes and and forward thinking weeks months even a few days out is a luxury um and and people get you they just kind of get wrapped up in that sprint mentality and this, right. is, this is a marathon all this stuff is a marathon that's true and uh yeah it, you might have um setbacks in the short term but you know we, we again in my experience i've certainly had no shortage of setbacks and our company has no shortage of setbacks on things but we learned them we we overcame them we changed our policies we right. implemented policies created procedures right and thank goodness they only cost us the little bit of money. No, in hindsight, now it wasn't that much money. If it would have happened now, right. it would cost us five times as much as them because five we have five as times as many employees. So, yep. Yep. Um, no, that's that's a, that's a good point. Thanks, Keith. Yeah. Um, and again, thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it, Keith no Armstrong, Ar- uh, Strong International Law Group. Again, uh, this podcast is brought to you by Harmony Photography, myharmonyphotography.com, and Devoted to Video. You can find uh, Dion with Devoted to Video on Facebook. And if you like what you're hearing, you're interested in uh, sponsoring this podcast, you can contact me at brian at brianlharding.com. Uh, before I get into next week, what's your favorite lawyer joke? Uh, lawyer jokes are bad for business. Okay. <laughs> well, so we'll skip, we'll skip the, you'll tell me off the air then. We'll, we'll skip <laughs> the lawyer joke. Right. I'll tell you my favorite plumbing joke off the air too. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's probably not nearly as good as yours. But um, next week, we're going to have in uh, Doug Hudak with BAM Design to talk about marketing. Uh, BAM is an acronym for Branding, Advertising, and Marketing. Doug Hudak has over 25 years of graphic design experience. Again, if you have questions you want me to ask Doug uh, between now and then, pop it in your head. Shoot me an email at brian at brianlharding.com. Uh, Doug's a super charismatic guy. You know Doug, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, well, he's um, awesome. He's got a huge personality. Uh, i really, really excited to talk, about, uh, talk to him. Keith, thanks again. You shared some great insight for our folks. I really appreciate thank it. Thanks for coming in. And uh, that's all for today. Uh, so thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.